So this is the first time I bought something for the channel I don't uh, personally need, but I've gone ahead and picked up a pair of these TP-Link Casa brand three-way smart switches. Hope you can see that okay. Um, because one, I love you all so much and money's no object. And two, because I started to become obsessed with this technology the same way I, I did with electric blanket controllers a couple of years ago. And that turned out to be a pretty good video for uh, the channel. Now, if you're watching this, you probably know that if you want to control a light from more than one location, you need to use something uh, we call in the U.S. a, a three-way switch. It should be called a three-terminal switch because it has, you know, three screws on it. Uh, and, and you use one at each end. And uh, on one end, where the power is coming in from the circuit breaker, uh, power gets thrown to one output terminal or the other, depending on which way the, the switch is toggled. These switches don't have an on or off. They just kind of have a this or that. So it sends it out this way or that way. And we connect two wires off of those output terminals. Those are called travelers. Um, so one always has electricity on it coming from the first switch. And then you go over here to the second switch on the way to the light. And uh, that switch takes one of the two traveler wires and makes it one output for the light. So one becomes two, two becomes one. Does that make make sense there? And so the, the first switch is always kind of throwing electricity down one of the other wires to the second switch going, here, catch this. And the other switch is, is going, uh, no, I don't want to, and run, kind of running away and responding to the, to the, the first switch. And if you want to control a light from uh, more than two locations, uh, three, four, or five, you put switches in the middle uh, that we call four-way switches because they have four terminals and should be called four terminal switches. Um, and what those do is uh, they, they, they toggle the two uh, wires effectively. You think I'm flipping them over. So then any switch along the way can uh, decide to jump on the line that has power or get off the line that has power and turn the light it's on and off. Uh, in the UK, they're more reasonable. They call the three-way switch a two-way switch because it can send current two ways. And they call a, a four-way switch a, an intermediate switch or a, or a crossover switch because it kind of lets the two travelers go straight through or, or crosses them over. I'm from an electronics background, so I prefer to call the three-way switches single-pole double-throw switches where a single pole, uh, where the pole refers to how many paths of current go through the box and um, the poles, the, the throws re refer to how many uh, output positions it goes to. So this has one current path through it and it goes to two throws. So it's single pole, double throw. The, the intermediate switches are double pole, double throw switches because they have two simultaneous paths of current through them, one for each um, uh, traveler, and then they can flip themselves between the two travelers. So there's two, two throws. In fact, it's kind of like having two three-way switches in one uh, box, you know, well, sort of. Uh, 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 anyway, that's more tutorial stuff than I <laughs> wanted to do. Uh, what happened was my friend Jordy called up and he said, hey, I, I got some of these. Can you help me put them into my garage to control the, the overhead uh, garage lights? Because I'm tired of, you know, my kids coming in from an all-night rave, leaving the lights on. And, and then we notice it at 4 a.m. from the house and no one wants to go down to the garage to turn the lights off. Uh, uh, but once you put these in, then, you know, you can yell at Alexa and have her uh, turn the lights off for you. So, uh, so that was the I idea. Uh, and that gets to why these are smart. They have a Wi-Fi radio and electronics inside of them, so you can put them on the net, and then uh, they are able to control the, the, the light remotely with an app and also tell you the current status of the light, whether it's on or off uh, in that uh, app. So I said, sure thing, happy to do it. Sounds like fun, I'll be down on uh, Wednesday. Uh, so the reason he called me is because his garage lights are actually controlled from three positions, which means he has a four-way switch in the middle, and that makes it complicated. So he's got a three-way, a four-way, and a three-way. And, um, and TP-Link is cagey about whether that'll work. You know, if you ask them, they go, well, might work. We haven't tested it. Don't know. Hmm, you know, da 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 uh, but, and then some people uh, on the net say it works great, some people say it doesn't. So uh, it was an area of uh, uh, much uh, confusion. As I started to research it, it became obvious that all kinds of people uh, were having all kinds of trouble uh, installing and using uh, these things, especially in, in, in four-way uh, setups. And uh, there was all this uh, uh, conflicting uh, uh, advice. Um, and I think the reason for that is you've got a lot of people with a lot of different levels of, of skill who have different short-term, you know, goals. Uh, by far the the and and of course a lot of them uh, uh, don't uh, write very thoroughly or frankly very well. 
Uh, so it gets hard to decipher what, what they're really saying a lot of the time. I think the biggest uh, group of these people are ones who simply wanted to get it going, so they want to know how to do it, they, which essentially means let me put this wire on this screw and you know, leave me alone. And that's great because that's the approach TP Link's uh, tutorial videos and their in-app setup wizard take to, to doing this. Uh, but it breaks down when the customer opens their box and suddenly finds a wire missing or they're all different colors or there's extra wires in the box or Uncle Buck when he uh, wired it up uh, the first time years ago illegally was hung over and did it in a completely non-standard way. So things can go off the rails, you know, pretty badly in that situation. So I think it's much better to understand the theory, like why it works, uh, or the, you know, get a kind of mental picture of why it works in your head. And then hopefully uh, you're able to uh, deal with any uh, specific physical variations in your local setup that you might uh, run across. At least that would be the, at least the, be the hope. I certainly think you have a better chance of, of, of doing that, uh, you know, if you, uh, if you kind of follow that um, uh, uh, approach. But anyway, uh, three-way switch wiring, even with manual switches, can be, you know, pretty daunting if you're not doing it all the time. And then when you add a CASA, my, you know, my gosh, you're adding uh, Wi-Fi radios and, and, and software and it gets really complicated. I mean, is the problem you're seeing a, a wiring problem? Uh, or is it because you have, you know, a bad uh, Wi-Fi situation? You know, is your router not accepting new Wi-Fi connections today? Because, you know, even in 2021, we seem unable to make a router with vendor software that can work for more than 60 days without being rebooted. Or, or is it buggy software from TP-Link, or is there something else on the phone, you know, interfering with their software? Uh, so it gets, you know, pretty uh, crazy pretty fast. Uh, the other thing is that people are kind of vague about what working means. They go, oh yeah, I got a four-way setup. It works great. Fantastic. Uh, but, but, you know, what do they really mean? I mean, I assume at a baseline that means that if they hit the button on the CASA or flip the four-way switch in the middle, the lights go on and off. But does it, does it also mean that the app is uh, correctly reporting the state of the light and that your app control is working, you know, reliably and, and all the time and not, you know, uh, a step behind what's really happening or something? Uh, so, um, it's, you know, so it's hard to actually, you know, figure out what, uh, what uh, folks mean. And then, of course, there's, there's all these questions that keep coming up all the time. Uh, do I have to use two of these in my circuit? Can I just get away with one? If I have to, if I can only use one, if I can get away with using one, why does CASA sell a kit of two? I'll tell you the reason they told me is for aesthetic reasons, so they, so they match uh, and look the same. Uh, that's not quite right. I found that out, so we'll talk about that. Um, you know, uh, and if I'm only using one CASA device, does it have to be in the first box from the circuit breaker or can it be in the box with the light? And, and what about when I start adding four-way switches? You know, then, then what happens? So it uh, gets, <laughs> gets a little crazy there. Um, so I was bopping around on the YouTube and the internet trying to figure out what other people have done and I came across a couple of good videos that uh, QT Tech Review did back in February, I think. And he pretty much made the, the basic video I was going to make in that he uh, draws out the, the circuits schematically and kind of animates them with a piece of paper and talks about them, kind of just like I did in the air here. And uh, then he walks through a simple install of uh, both a uh, two control point three-way switch circuit and a three control point uh, circuit with a four-way uh, switch in it and he explains it as he goes and he shows the app and he and he you know and he and he shows it working uh, so that means I don't have to do all that kind of tutorial stuff so thank you uh, QT tech review for uh, for that uh, you know uh, appreciate that um, so if, if you don't understand how three and four-way switch wiring works you don't have a good picture in your mind you should definitely check those out I'll put a card up here and link to those uh, uh, down below uh, because I'm going to start to use terms like line side box which is where the power comes in from the circuit breaker box and load side box which is where the power goes out to the light or whatever you're you know you're running and I'm not going to stop to explain them anymore and um, and, and and you need that kind of mental picture in your head of how the wiring works so that we can kind of you know get on into the, into the real hairy stuff a, a, a little bit. Um, now, QT Tech Review's videos showed, he has one showing uh, two three-way switches working, or, well, he has videos showing uh, a three-way circuit working with one CASA device, and he has a video showing uh, a circuit with a four-way switch in it working with one CASA device too. And he goes as far even as to show um, 
uh, uh, the app co correctly controlling the lights and, and tracking the state. So that's great. He did a real good job. I mean, I probably would have talked faster and made more jokes, but you know, he did. He he basically got it down. Um, uh, so that answered one question for me right away, uh, which you know is how does the app know whether the lights are on or off, uh, so it can show it in the app. Uh, and does the, do these switches do some kind of current sensing to, to determine that? Can they detect electricity flowing? Do they detect the magnetic field around a wire when, a, when, a, um, when, when current is on? Or do they do it some other way? Because you know, a cheaper way to do it without current sensing would be to require that you put two of these CASAs on each end, one in each box, and then software could interrogate each, the position of each switch uh, over the air. And, and divine whether the light is on and off based on the position of the two switches. However, that wouldn't work with a four-way switch in the middle because you'd be able to toggle the, the state of the light, you know, kind of underneath the two casas and they wouldn't, have, they wouldn't know it had changed. And there's no way to interrogate that because, you know, as I say, casa doesn't make a four-way smart switch. Uh, so I always figured they had to do current sensing. Uh, because otherwise no four-way switch circuit would work. And there's enough um, reports and now uh, QT Tech Reviews videos showing they work. So, uh, so these must do current sensing. How well it works, that's a, a different question. But the interesting thing about QT Tech Reviews videos is that he kept making sure the one CASA device he was using was going into the first box, the line side box. And, you know, from a current sensing perspective, I couldn't see any reason why you needed to do that. You can, you can sense current um, uh, flowing uh, in either box on its way to the light. So that, that didn't seem to be, uh, um, you know, a concern. Uh, and then I think there's sort of a, um, what do I want to say, some kind of superstition uh, that if you put it in the first box, where it's ahead of all the other devices switching on the way to the light, that it, it can exert some kind of magical influence on all the four and three-way switches down the road, be they manual switches or casas or dimmers or whatever, you know. Uh, but, you know, that's just kind of uh, superstitious. But, uh, but it is a thing when you only have one casa, people always put them in that first in that line side box. And it seems to be what they're thinking is that the Wi-Fi electronics need to have continuous power to keep their radios up all the time. And, and at first that made perfect sense to me. In fact, that's why you need a neutral wire in the box to keep those electronics powered up. Until I started to think about uh, the casa switch in, a, in a, a, a load side box, because after all, they sell this kit of two. So besides aesthetics, they expect you to put one you know, in that far side box. And, and I started to think, gee, if these switches really do just take their power from the common you know, input terminal on this side, common output terminal on that side, wouldn't a CASA in the far side load side box uh, always be being switched on and off with the light, you know? Uh, and that just seemed wrong to me. So about this time, I got into a long discussion uh, in the comment thread on uh, uh, TP-Link's uh, official YouTube channel uh, underneath their official uh, tutorial video for these switches, the install video for these, the one with the robo lady. And I kind of asked that question, you know, how, what about one in a far side box? Does, does it go on and off with the, with the lights? And we went back and forth and got, you know, I got some half answers. Uh, but in the end, TP-Link seemed to be asserting, I'll link to this so you can go over there and read it, but TP-Link seemed to be asserting that, um, Yes, uh, if you use one CASA device, it has to be in the first device for continuous power and, and a uh, TP-Link in a far box will, uh, <laughs> will the, electron, the Wi-Fi electronics will be switching off with, 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 the, with the light, in the, you know, with the, with the condition of the lights. Uh, that really smelled wrong to me. And, and plus, I, you know, I've been an embedded firmware engineer for 30 years uh, and in the last five years I was working on a globally shipped Internet of Things device. Uh, so I kind of have a feel for how they're designed and how they work. Um, and uh, it was a consumer device. And, uh, and the problems and, and how you're trying to make it cheap but make it reliable. So it seemed much more logical to me that the way to power the Wi-Fi electronics in one of these things would be to take power from the traveler screws, either one of them, whichever one's on, because one of the travelers is always going to be on in, in both boxes. And if you take power from the travelers, maybe with a capacitor to float over any switching, then you're guaranteed that the Wi-Fi electronics are going to be on all the time. And yet here was TP-Link saying on their YouTube channel, no, the, you have to put it in the, in the near box and in the far box, the, uh, the, um, you know, the electronics are going to go on and off. So I went down to my buddy Jordy's house to do uh, the install and decided to run some tests to see uh, whether I could power them from the travelers or not. And if I could power from the travelers, then did the TP-Link switch have to really be in the first box or could it be in the, in the you know, in the load side box? So uh, 
so that's what I'm going to show you now. Um, and this is what happened. And I hope you enjoy it. I didn't bring uh, this mic, so please excuse the in-camera audio. So let me give you the lay of the land. This is a very nice three-car garage, but I want to show you how the four-way circuit we're going to look at here. It, uh, the lights on the ceiling can be controlled from three positions. And so over here by the door, we've, we've taken this apart and uh, disconnected the hot wire. We know this is the line side box. This is where power is fed into the fed into the system. And then the power goes up the ceiling, across the room, all the way to the other side. And then behind this, uh, this storage box here, gonna take that out. That's a four-way switch uh, sitting between the two travelers. So that's the second position. And then finally, in the back there, is the other three-way switch, the, the last three-way switch, the end, the load side, before the power goes up to the lights. And this is where TP-Link says not to put a three-way switch. All right, so I'm here at my buddy Jordy's house and we're putting in these Kaza three-way switches and we figured out uh, which of the boxes is the line and load side. This is the, uh, the, the load side. Um, and so everybody says that the Kaza uh, can't, can't go in here because uh, apparently it won't get power. Uh, so, but I really wanted to check that out before we did it. So I've got my, my suicide cord down here. You see that, all right? And uh, I have um, connected the zip cord to kind of like Shango here. We've taken the neutral to the neutral and the hot to the common. And this is what everybody says will work. And this is why it has to be in the first box, everybody says, because this gets continuous power. Um, and in fact, if I plug this in here, it clicks and I don't know, can you see the, the light is coming on now? So the, so this is working, it's electronics are powered. So that's great. However, I keep saying that it has to be the travelers that are powered. If you're gonna put one in the far box because the uh, common terminal is gonna be going off and on uh, and it would be better if uh, you powered it from either whichever terminal is, is toggled on at the moment. So now if I take my, uh, my hot here and connect it to one of the two travelers on top, if I can get it on here, let's see if we can get to either of these. Yeah, come on. I gotta, there we go. All right, that's now on one of the travelers. And we'll go ahead and plug it in again. Oh, look, it comes on again. Yeah, you can see the, the little lights coming on. And in fact, we've already done this before we turn the camera on, and I know it'll be powered from both tra uh, travelers. So the truth is, these Kazas are powered from any one of the terminals that has current on it. And uh, that's the secret to keeping power up in the far box, which also seems to indicate that the uh, one Casa you use in one of these three-way circuits does not have to be in the line side. It seems like it would work perfectly well in the load side as well, but we'll, we'll figure that out down the road. So let me show you what I mean. This is, this is the line side where TP-Link would like us to stick the device. And I'm gonna turn the lights in here off. And now if we go back over here. Oh, look, the TP-Link is still on because it's getting power from one of the travelers now. All right, so take a look at this scary stuff. We've, we've turned the power back on and we've used alligator clips to wire in the new Kaza to the, uh, uh, this is the load side, this is the light side. This is the box you're not supposed to put a Kaza on. And uh, first of all, you can see it's uh, blinking and we've looked and it, it's up on Wi-Fi, so it is uh, behaving as an access point now and wants uh, the app to send it the network credentials of the network it's eventually going to be connected to. But, aha. Oh, look, it's switching anyway, just fine, in this wrong box. So now the question is, uh, if we configure it on the CASA app, will it uh, come up okay and will it be showing the correct state? And I'm saying it will, uh, but we'll see. Here. Oh, oh, yeah, yeah. yeah. So, so, so we've configured this, this, this switch on the, uh, let's see, where is it there? We're looking here on the bottom, garage lights. Uh, Okay, garage light switch, and the lights are off and the, the state is off. And uh, you can obviously uh, turn them on and off uh, with the app now. Why don't you go ahead and turn it on with the app? 
Okay, so now all the lights are on and the state has changed. Go ahead and turn it back off. Oop. Did it turn it off? <laughs> yeah, okay, woo, we gotta get the, 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 oh, the state's wrong now. Wait, wait, I'll take a beat. You'll get it. Oh, ooh. It's still? It, it got it. It got it. So we have a little update problem, but it is, but it is working. Now, let me go over here and sort of underneath, uh, unbeknownst to the CASA, I will manually change it. This is the, uh, the line side box. This is where power comes into the system. We'll turn that on. And we'll give him a second here. Come on, baby. <laughs> when if we we're in I good we're software. Good, when if we're in good Wi-Fi here. <laughs> So I'm leaving now, but that was very interesting. You saw it working there in the load side box, uh, but as we started to, uh, and it seemed to be fine and tracking state okay, but as we got into it more, playing with the manual switches and trying to change the state, you know, underneath the CASA, uh, it wouldn't track it reliably. So we went ahead and moved that switch to the line side box where it would, you know, would always have constant power, although we know power is not the uh, problem uh, anymore. And, um, but maybe current sensing is, I'll get to that. But anyway, so, so we put it there and then we tried it again and it still wasn't reliable. In fact, it, it seemed to be pretty regular that you'd, you'd hit the app to change it and it wouldn't hear it. And then you'd hit the app again and it would hear it, but it, the state indicator would be reversed to what it should be and it would stay reversed. And you could run the manual switches and, and the, and the cause app wouldn't see them at all. So this is strange because I've seen the YouTube videos where people have done this and it's worked fine. It's true it's a four-way circuit, but I don't think that should make any difference because it's just, you know, travelers. Uh, so we went ahead and put in the other switch and before we configured it, uh, tried it, and it worked fine. Everything worked fine. Uh, so how did it get better with the second switch not even on the Wi-Fi? It was still in access point mode. And yet it did something because suddenly it was working. Are they talking to each other on the travelers? Is there a signaling going on along with the AC between the two? Don't know. So we're gonna have to take this on the bench and do some experiments and see if we can figure out what's actually going on. It's really an interesting problem. Okay, thanks to the mighty miracle of plywood and drywall screws, I've gone ahead and put together this ugly lash up and the setup is the same as we've been dealing with all along. The power comes in here to a three-way switch. There's a four-way switch in the middle. And then I put the Kaza on the end in what would be the load side box. Stuck the uh, neutrals uh, up here out of the way because they're not really important for this. And the ground wire on the Kaza is not connected to anything because we don't need it. I went ahead and drew this picture that shows the relation of the switch to the schematic uh, current flow through the device. So uh, with this three-way switch in this position here, current goes up. So juice coming in here into the system on this common screw will be sent across this device and out on this red traveler on top. If I flip this the other way to this position, then the current uh, will go down. I realize this is not the greatest uh, artwork in the world. Uh, it'll go across and out on this black traveler. Same thing here with this switch in this position. The connections are crossed, so right now it's this way and this way. So juice coming in here would go across and out on the red traveler. Juice coming in here would go down and out on the black traveler. If I put it this way, it's straight through. So now in this configuration, juice comes in here, it goes out this lower one, and then out this other lower one to the uh, CASA. The nice thing about having the four-way in this position is it's straight through. It kind of almost takes it out of the circuit. So I can vary where the current is uh, on these travelers just by flipping this first switch, um, which will be handy in a second. I'll, I'll show you. Uh, this whole mess is on a isolation transformer, so I don't uh, shock myself. Uh, and I think the first thing I want to talk about is the notion of continuous power because it turned out uh, I was right and TP-Link was also kind of right in uh, what we call here in the Silicon Valley an edge case. Let me uh, go ahead and power the system here. And um, uh, let me unscrew this light and I'm going to turn off this overhead. And I think now on the overhead camera you can see the um, 
Wi-Fi electronics are powered now inside of the Casa. And if you flip these switches, it stays powered. So it is taking power from the traveler. Uh, however, it is true that as these switches are changing from one position to another, they move through the middle where they're not connected to anything. And that is the edge case. So if I move this uh, three-way into the center position, let's see if it'll stay there, kills the power. And, because there's no power anywhere in the system. And then if I throw it all the way, then it comes on again and you, you have juice. So um, the four-way switch is even worse because it uh, breaks right away when you start to move it. And then it has a really long arc until uh, you get to the other end and it makes and power comes on again. So if you flip the switches fast enough, everything's great. Um, but uh, the reality is uh, TP-Link didn't use a capacitor to float over the, the cha switching changes, as I kind of suggested in the first segment, uh, it seems like. So, uh, yes, uh, TP-Link is kind of right in that if you park the switch in the middle or go really slowly, it'll go off and back on. If you flip it at a good clip, it won't. So uh, there's that. Split decision on that. Let me turn this uh, uh, back on. Another interesting and unexpected discovery is that uh, in an ordinary manual situation, uh, you'd always expect one or the other of these two travelers to be dead. Uh, for example, right now with the switches the way they are, all the current's going down the black wire, so the red wire should be dead. But whenever I turn the Kaza on, and right now it's kind of passing current through this way, um, electricity shows up on the red uh, traveler, which should be dead. So the cause is driving current onto the quote-unquote dead traveler. And I guess that's because it hangs its electronics uh, between the two travelers to power them. I need to kind of do some drawing to figure out how that is uh, schematically. Uh, it's about, the voltage on the red wire right now is about 10 volts less than the black wire. I actually did put the scope on this earlier and uh, flip back and forth uh, on this first uh, traveler to move the uh, on this first switch to move the current between the two travelers and um, you can see it go up and down 10 volts so so something about the electronics in here is is causing a voltage drop of uh, of 10 volts and putting power on the other uh, dead traveler um, I don't know if that's just a side effect of the way it's wired it probably is although it could be a way to for a Kaza at the first position to detect the presence of a Kaza on the other end but they probably don't need to do that because they have network connectivity, I think, right now. But we'll see how that is. Uh, the other thing I did is I did put uh, this on the scope because I wanted to see if the Kaza uh, was doing any kind of signaling on the AC line. And so I zoomed way in looking for some kind of modulation on the zero crossing of the AC waveform, but I didn't. So it doesn't seem like uh, it's doing any kind of uh, signaling at least uh, in this state, because right now it's unconfigured and just sort of um, sitting here waiting to be put on a, a LAN. And finally, I got another clue from this uh, quick look uh, about the, there's a relay in here, you can hear it clicking. Um, and uh, so what it's doing is, is um, sending power this way or this way. And when the relay is de-energized, it sits in this position. And when it's energized, it goes click and flips over here to the black traveler in uh, this uh, setup, or the left screw if you were looking at it from the front in, in any Kaza. Um, and it remembers the state of that relay in non-volatile memory. Uh, and so what happens when you first apply power is the microprocessor fires up and says, oh, what, what position did I have the relay in? Was it energized or not? And then it goes ahead and energizes it if it needs to, to get it into this position. Uh, for example, right now it's on, so it is in this position. Um, if I and if I kill the power to everything, it will remember that the relay was in in this position and it needs to turn it on. Uh, so now, if I flip this first switch and put the tra the, the electricity onto the pink travelers. The circuit should be off when it comes on. So when I give it power, you'll see the, because it's de-energized, the relay will be like this. So when I give it power for just a brief moment, a uh, current will flow in here through the pink traveler, uh, th through my pen, <laughs> through this switch uh, to the light. And the light will come on for a second. Then the microprocessor in here is going to wake up and go, oh, I need to energize the relay. And it'll go click and flip it over here. 
onto the black travelers, which don't have any current now, and the light will go off. So we should see the light come on for a minute and then go off. Here we go. One, two, three. Catch that? And uh, you can do the uh, reverse if I kill power again. And now um, power's on the black. There will be a delay um, turning it on because now it's on the pink track. De-energized, it's on the, on the red uh, traveler, which um, doesn't have any current on it. So it'll take a minute to wake up and turn on. So I'll turn the power on and then a beat later, the light will come on. So on, on. So there you go. Uh, so my original plan with this was to try to duplicate what we saw at Jordy's house in that I put a Kaza in this position and we configured it and it didn't work very well with the app. And so then I moved it to this first position and it still didn't work very well with the app, which was confusing because it worked fine in QT Tech Reviews videos with this same setup and a manual switch here. And then we added the second Kaza at Jordy's house. And before we even configured the second Kaza, everything worked great in the app. It was as though this was really helping uh, the first one in some as yet unknown way. So that's kind of the mystery here. I don't know if we'll be able to figure it out or not. Uh, in the meantime, I started to read around um, online and uh, came across a uh, master's thesis paper that a fellow by the name of Andrew Halterman did at Iowa State University. I don't know what it is about Iowa State University, but in my career, I have worked with a lot of really great engineers who came out from Iowa State, you know, in the 80s and really kind of made the microcomputer uh, revolution happen. So shout out to Iowa State. But he collected all the research. He's a security researcher, so they're trying to attack these things and figure out how to, you know, um, take them over and do denial of service attacks and everything with them. Uh, but the nice thing is his paper collects all the research and he did his own research. And they've spent a lot of time uh, analyzing the protocol that is used over the air to uh, talk to these things. So right now, this is up as an access point, uh, just waiting for, it's unconfigured, waiting for credentials for the um, uh, network it's eventually going to be on to be pushed to it by the, by the Kaza app. But it also turns out that if you want to, you can connect to it with a desktop uh, PC. And, uh, and if you uh, analyze it, I used a tool you network hackers will know about called Nmap, and I did a port scan on this. And uh, it turns out that, uh, yes, port uh, 9999 is open. It's the only port that's open. And it's open both uh, on TCP and UDP. Uh, if all, everything I just said doesn't make any sense to you, you're not a computer geek, don't uh, worry about it too much. I'm, I'm sorry, but... Um, um, you know, this is going to get a little computery uh, for a minute here. Essentially, it, it, it means that um, the CASA is on the air and even unconfigured. It is listening for commands to be shot to it on uh, what we call a port, which is kind of like, a, gosh, how to describe it, uh, a doorway, you know, that's, that has an address on it of 9999. And so if I send commands uh, through, that, through that hole, through that doorway, I can tell the, the CASA to, to do things. The nice thing about his paper is he uh, printed uh, the source to a nice Python script at the end of it uh, to send commands to the device. And so I ripped it out of, uh, copy and pasted it out of his paper into the mighty power of Emacs and to reformat it, which was uh, trivial, uh, and uh, then got it to run. And so now I can send commands to uh, this from my desktop app, which is great because I can control exactly what I'm sending. And I discovered something interesting that I, I'd uh, like to show you. So this is the editor on my desktop machine. It's just across the room from the board with the switches and lights on it. And I've got a camera over there pointed at that. Um, this is Mr. Halterman's uh, Python script that I lifted from his paper. And uh, it's the result of a lot of people doing a lot of packet sniffing and reverse engineering the uh, protocol that's used to control the smart switches. Um, uh, so it's, it's nice to have because obviously TP-Link hasn't, uh, you know, really published any of this. Uh, so the, yeah, this is the TP-Link Smart Home Protocol, TSHP, and the switch over there is listening on point, uh, on port 999 for, uh, for commands to come to it, uh, using this protocol to, to make it, uh, do things. So if I switch to a command buffer here, um, uh, do this here. So um, the 
the smart switches uh, come up as, as an access point, uh, uh, and I say we'll take commands even when they're unconfigured, and they come up with, with the address 192.168.0.1, which is in the reserved IP4 address range, and, and it's uh, effectively stating that it's you know the router on, on this little network, which only has two things on it, the switch and my, my desktop uh, PC here. And uh, uh, let me... I think it's get info. Is that right? Let's see what happens here. Yeah. So um, what it does is it sends JSON formatted ASCII and receives JSON formatted ASCII. Uh, I know this is going to sound like like gobbledygook to some of you, and I'm sorry. Uh, uh, JSON is JavaScript object notation. It's these little curly brackets and this particular way of in, indenta in, indenting things. It's a structured way to um, uh, send data that both humans and machines can sort of read easily. And uh, they didn't use a uh, secure socket layer or anything to encrypt this. They just do kind of a simple rolling XOR on it. So it's not the most uh, cryptographically uh, secure thing uh, in the world. But anyway, the interesting thing, and the thing I want to show you is that right now I can, let's go back. Uh, so it's on, I can say turn off which flips the which flips the relay and I can say turn on which also flips the relay uh, but let me um, let me turn it off again okay now I'm gonna walk across the room so it turned it off and now I'm gonna flip this switch and put move the current from the black traveler to the pink traveler and now it's on. So if I go back to my desktop machine now and I say turn off again, it turns it off. So it's not just saying uh, energize the relay, de-energize the relay. This is smart. It knows which way off is. Does that make sense? It also knows which way on is. For example, we'll do, we can do the reverse. Let me turn it on and walk across the room here and turn it off. You see, and now it has to do something different to get the light to come back on. But if I say turn on again, voila, the light comes on. So it knows what to do to make the light go on or off. Now, in the position it's in, it can just use, uh, uh, it, could, it could just decide that by seeing which of the two travelers has current on it. But when this is in this position, that won't work because it's always on. So I guess it's doing some kind of uh, current measurement to figure this out. But it's going to be interesting to move this to the front and see how it behaves when we do the same experiment uh, over there. So here we are with the board turned around. The unconfigured CASA is now in the first position, the line side position, and the story is still the same. Switching works fine and the CASA is driving current onto what should be a dead traveler uh, every time the lights are on. And it doesn't matter what switch turns the lights on, it could be the CASA itself or anything else. Whenever that light's on, there is current on the dead traveler. Right now, all the current uh, is going down the the red traveler, and, and let me bring the multimeter up here. Don't let those numbers on the screen now fool you. That's millivolts if you look in the upper right corner. But if I measure here between uh, the, tra the hot traveler and ground and neutral, we get the, the we get 120. If I go to the other side, we get 111. Well, this should be zero or close to zero. So, uh, so there's a you know, a 10 volt voltage difference here. If I measure between the two travelers, I should get 10 volts, and I do sometimes, but right now I'm getting like 1.3. So I think the impedance of the meter is messing with whatever's going on here a little bit. I tried to use my VTVM to double check this, but it doesn't seem to be working. Let's see, if I mush this around, sometimes I can get... Well, I have seen 10 volts here. I don't I don't know what, what this is, why, why there isn't a, a 10 volt differential. I'm assuming that's operator error, and there is a 10 volt differential between these uh, these two between the two travelers when the, when the light's on. And I'm thinking at this point that it's not software that's deciding to drive current onto this, it's just the way this thing is wired. Because I don't know if you noticed here very, they don't call this out very much, but there's a, a reset which erases all the information, personal information on the device and a reboot button. 
And if I, um, let's see, can I get this in here and uh, put this here, get my 100 and, eh, careful, 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 there we go. Um, I need something to, okay, so there's my, if I push the uh, reboot button and, and if I hold it down, uh, the current still stays up. Oh, it jumped up 10, though. That's interesting. It's going to go back down. That's interesting. Anyway, the fact that there's still current on the dead wire, this is kind of an interesting position, even when I'm holding the reset button down, kind of makes me think it's a wiring thing and not a software choice. So I'm starting to believe that this explains why when you add a unconfigured CASA into the circuit like we did at Geordie's and suddenly everything got better, it's because you have a second CASA uh, driving current on the, you know, dead traveler, and the CASA can look at that voltage differential between the two travelers to help decide if the light is on. And, of course, he has a longer run and uh, a different characteristic impedance to his wires. Um, I still haven't seen any uh, signaling with the oscilloscope. So, yeah, so let's review. Um, uh, at power on, this works like this, that, this, that. But once the microprocessor is running, it knows on, off, on, off. And um, because of the way it's wired, there seems to be some voltage differential between the two travelers when it's on, no matter who turns it on. So that so that's either an artifact of the way it's wired or how it's doing current sensing, I don't know. But that seems to be key to how, that there is some, uh, what do I say, communication between the two ends. There's an inference because if, that if the dead traveler has juice on it, that, that there's, uh, that the, you know, that the, 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 what do I say, that the, the, the load is on. I'm going to try a less resistive load in this to see if it changes anything. I'll put an LED bulb in it with a lower power factor just to see, but I don't expect it to. So uh, now I'm going to put this back here and configure it up in software and play with it that way. Okay, so I did try some different loads in this socket and it didn't make a difference. So we're back to the original setup, except what's different now is the CASA has been configured onto the Wardco wireless network. So it's not an access point anymore. It's a client on my network. So this is how it would normally operate in your house after everything's set up. And it's been paired to this iPhone. And over here, I have uh, what's called a packet sniffer. This is Wireshark. I remember when it used to be called Ethereal back in the old days. But uh, uh, what this lets me do is look at all the uh, traffic on the radios and see all the stuff going back and forth, all the conversations on the air. And uh, this is set up to decode my Wi-Fi. And also I've put in a, a dissector that a nice German fellow wrote a few years ago to do the rolling XOR and, and decrypt the actual CASA packet so we can look at the actual uh, CASA protocol stuff. And there's a screen capture program running in here. So I hope all this works. It's an awful lot of technology. Uh, anyway, I really kind of want to see what's happening with, um, uh, with this whole thing when it's running. And this uh, packet sniffer will be useful when I have two of these things and we, we tell the app that there are two of them to see because I think it repeats the command to both of them. But let me show you what I've uh, discovered here. First of all, let me start a capture. And now I'm going to reboot the CASA so that the packet sniffer can see the uh, CASA come on the network and do the uh, cryptographic key exchange. And um, the sniffer will see the key exchange and then it'll be able to decode uh, the Wi-Fi traffic. And right away what happens is the CASA is booting here it contacts uh, the mother ship, this uh, use one um, API TP link server, uh, which is actually running in the Amazon Web Services cloud if you do a reverse uh, DNS lookup on it. And then it also uh, talks to a second TP link server, which is called the dev server. So, so right away, the, the switch knows to, to get on the global internet and uh, talk, talk back to home base. And then it kind of, Waits here. An interesting thing I've noticed. Let's see if I'll just sit here. I'll speed this up if it's going to take too long. But hang on, just sitting here. So this is this was the interesting thing. I have a Google Home device. It turns out that the Google Home sends a two-byte packet to the CASA that has just A and B in it, and then the CASA squirts out uh, back uh, to it this 577-byte uh, packet. 
So there's two kinds of ways that things can communicate on the internet. One is a TCP, the Terminal Control Program, which is a uh, in order end to end error corrected protocol. It's basically a pipe. You can just shove uh, data down and and not worry about it. It will get there even if there's problems along the way. And the other is uh, something called UDP, which is uh, much more lightweight, the Universal Datagram Protocol, which is like throwing a message in a bottle and throwing it in the stream and hoping it gets there. And so what's interesting is that the Google Home touches the Casa and then the Casa squirts this packet back. And I wanted to see what that uh, was. So I went ahead and I wrote this uh, Casa decode program. Uh, let me go back here. And I pasted the uh, bytes from the, uh, from the UDP packet, the 577 bytes, and decoded it. And it's a get info packet. So the Google Home has gotten the CASA to start broadcasting its status. And in this info packet, the sysinfo packet, is whether the CASA is on or off. Uh, this is relay state down here, and it's zero. So right now the CASA is off. So that was interesting. And then as this continues, we'll get back here. Let's go to this now. And I'm going to turn on the, um, the iPhone. And let me... Uh, punch in my passcode secretly so you can't see it. Uh, and we will start the Casa app. And so I call this the device list. And this was uh, where we first had problems at uh, Jordy's house in that the state would change on this and it wouldn't update. But actually uh, what happens if you look at the uh, trace here is that the I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I, I don't want to take too much time with this. So I'll capture this and go back and uh, explain it. But essentially what's happening is the, the CASA does a, what do I want to say? The, the app says, uh, hi there, Switch. Give me, your, uh, give me your info. Tell me whether you're on or off. And uh, then it also asks for its, uh, what is it? Get next, next action. I guess there's some timed actions. Um, I don't know whether that's because it really cares about anything in this action table that's supposedly in here, or whether it just wants to uh, elicit a uh, response from the switch, because what happens is once it does that, the CASA starts sending status every five seconds to, to the app on the phone. So now every five, so I thought that the application was asking the switch you know, every five seconds or so uh, for its status saying, you know, get info, get info, get info, saying, are you on, are you on, are you on? And, um, and that's what we call polling. But it also looks like because the CASA perhaps does this uh, get, next, um, uh, uh, get next action command, the CASA starts broadcasting over UDP, starts squirting messages in a bottle, very lightweight to the app every five seconds going, Here's my status, here's my status, here's my status. And he's doing it to the Google Home too, although less frequently. So the CASA switch is kind of slutty about uh, sharing its uh, uh, status with everybody on the, on the network, which I uh, didn't uh, realize. But anyway, you can see that here. If I uh, turn this on, this'll, this will come on in less than five seconds. So one, two, three. Okay, that was three. Turn it off. One, two, three. Four. And it really doesn't matter um, uh, where, who does it, because he does current sensing. So we turn it on and go one, two, three, four. Now this has been very well behaved on my desk, but obviously this is the screen we first had problems with at uh, Jordy's house. Let me turn this off. One, two, three, four, five. Um, and I don't know why. Was it a bad network or what? Uh, but um, this is what first clued us in that it was a problem, but it's working perfectly here, of course. But the interesting thing is, so this device list is, is updating every five seconds, either because it's getting UDP packets every five seconds or it's, it's asking, you know, every now and then too. But if you go into the detail screen, this one, which you would expect would be polling just as fast because, gosh, someone's really paying attention to the switch now. And... Um, you know, they really want to know the status, but this one uh, updates much, much slower. And uh, I'm not sure if it actually gets the UDP broadcast, but it asks for the state once a minute. And if I, if I wait here appropriately, uh, let's, uh, let's turn everything on. 
You can see the command go through there to the Casa and turn it on. And uh, now at some point, he's going to ask for the status. Okay, I'm going to assume that's it and I'm going to start the stopwatch. And you can see it's off. I think it's going to take the better part of a minute before this updates. We'll speed it up. So there you go. Yeah, 59 seconds. So I, I did it pretty good there, thanks to Wireshark letting me see what was actually going on. So off camera, this was most of the problem Jordy and I were having, was, you know, we'd do things and it would take forever to update. And we thought this would be updating quickly, but it's really only updating every minute. Whereas the other screen, the device screen, which we showed you in the video and we had that uh-oh screen, uh, is actually updating pretty fast and seems to be working here. So I'm going to move this switch back here. Look at this again. I expect it'll be the same. And then I'm going to put an unconfigured Casa in this position and see if our updates get better and kind of look at the network traffic with Wireshark in the two Casa situation. So I thought it might be worthwhile to take a moment and explain why the Casa switches talking to the TP-Link cloud. Uh, imagine you have your, your iPhone here, more my uh, great art, and you have your Casa switch here, and you're sitting at your house, and uh, both of these are on your local network, so the iPhone, the Casa app, and the Casa can talk back and forth on your local net just fine. And in fact, if the internet's off, you'll see the Casa app say local only, and it means that this is what it's doing. Uh, but the reason it's talking to the uh, two servers in the TP-Link cloud, which is running on Amazon Web Services, imagine you have your, your router, and it's got a big firewall, of course, to keep uh, bad stuff out here on the, the internet from, from, from getting in. And it's, you know, stuff bounces off that firewall, so bad stuff can't get into your house. Uh, now, imagine you are out, uh, out in the world driving around, and you want to control your Casa switch from, you know, another state. So, uh, so there you are in your, in your car. What beautiful artwork. Okay. <laughs> and, uh, and you decide you want to talk to it. Well, your phone can't get through the, the firewall to talk to the Casa. So uh, it's going to talk to the TP-Link cloud. Um, and say, please turn on the Casa or, or do whatever to the Casa. But uh, the TP-Link cloud can't get through your firewall either. So what uh, the Casa does from inside your firewall, it punches out just like you were going to a website. And it makes a permanent, it nails up a connection to uh, the TP-Link cloud. And it uses HTTP to get through your firewall. But once it does that, it probably switches to another protocol called WebSockets or another one called HTTP2 to maintain this uh, persistent uh, link. And so now when you're out in your car and you go through the TP-Link cloud, we'll make it a pretty cloud, and then come down this pipe that the Casa has opened up and into it. And just a cursory glance at the Wireshark trace, uh, it looks like it's the, the, the server that's named dev is the one that's up all the time. The one named API seems to come up and go down. All right, let's get back to it. And here we are back this way with the configured Casa moved from the load position to the line position. And nothing to report. Everything's identical. Same uh, on the network. Same delays in the app. Except there is one electrical difference. Um, if I turn this on and hit the reboot switch, the light doesn't go off like it did before. And I also measured this and the power on the, um, the quote-unquote dead traveler doesn't change the way it did. Uh, I assume because now this is being powered off the common on continuous power. Uh, so that's yet another clue about how this thing is wired internally. Wireshark does show it rebooting. So I guess the only way to really figure this out and understand it will be to big clive this and rip into it and photograph it and reverse engineer it. But I'm not going to do it on this video because we're already coming up on an hour long. And I'm surprised you watched this long. So let me get the unconfigured Casa and we'll stick it here and see uh, if that makes things better. This is our last physical setup and the second to the last logical setup. The old configured Casa is here, uh, acting as a client on my Wi-Fi network and presenting its full wireless API to the iPhone and anybody else. And this is the new unconfigured 
CASA that's acting as an access point and uh, waiting to be uh, configured and presenting a, a more limited API, I believe, to uh, the local uh, network over the air. And uh, this is the situation we got to at Jordy's house where we added this unconfigured CASA and everything started working great in the app. Well, here it hasn't changed a thing. Uh, this uh, screen still updates very quickly and uh, this screen still updates very slowly. Um, uh, so I don't know what happened at the garage, but I'm not going to speculate on it right now. I'll save that for the conclusion. I also use the desktop client to send one command at a time to this while it's uh, in unconfigured mode and look at what it was uh, doing. And I use Wireshark to sniff it. And uh, I can't get it to send me status the way it was doing to the Google Home or even to the app with, or over UDP with any of that stuff. So it'll be interesting once this is configured to see if that changes and also when we tell the app that we have two three-way switches on this circuit, uh, how that changes what the app does. So uh, let's move along and do that. So when you're using the app to set up two of these CASA switches on one circuit, when you get to the end of configuring the first one, the app asks you to quote unquote pair the second one by holding the paddle down on the other switch for five seconds. Uh, this pairing process is, you know, that kind of implies it does something profound and interesting, the two, you know, get together and work in some coordinated fashion. And in fact, all through this video, I've been saying that I thought they'd both be on the network, both switches on the circuit, and, and that the app would repeat the command to both of them to give you, you know, a better chance of a local Wi-Fi connection, because, you know, why not? Because uh, the switches are so smart about whether the lights are on or off. But that is not actually what happens. Pairing turns out to be much more uh, disappointing than that. You're looking at a program called Wi-Fi Explorer, and um, I have it limited to only show open networks, and the only two open things are my two CASA switches, and they are both in access point mode waiting to be uh, configured. If I click on this here, you'll see this is, they're centered, they're on channel six, and that's the bandwidth. That's one of them, and this is the other one. And the interesting column to watch will be this uh, scene column over here that says, you know, how long ago it was seen. So actually, after you've paired one, all, I mean, after you've configured one, all pairing does, well, is, is take it off the network and put it in zombie mode so it's never uh, in access point mode or client mode again. It just effectively, um, you know, um, denudes it or, or makes, it a, makes it a zombie that just sits there and is only kind of a, a fancy and expensive manual switch. Uh, so I'm going to go over across the room now and hold, hold this one of these down for five seconds. One two, three, four, five, and a pinch to grow an inch. And we'll let that up. And I, the light now has gone from blinking orange green to a solid ring. And now if we look at this here, I'll speed this up. But in one minute, it'll drop one of these. And let's undo that. First thing that'll happen uh, after 15 seconds, one of these should dim, I think. There it's dimmed, and in a minute it'll go away. And there you are. So pairing mode really just makes one of the switches a zombie manual switch, a very expensive manual switch. So, you know, gee whiz, uh, if, unless, if you don't care about the aesthetics, only buy one of these uh, 210s because <laughs> there's no reason to spend a lot of money on another one because it's not used for anything. So here we are in the final setup with both of these configured. Obviously, I didn't do it the Kaza way because then one of these switches would just be an expensive dumb switch. I configured them both separately and said there was one each time. And I think this may be a better setup for daily use, even though it, the device list is more cluttered because, you know, if one uh, Kaza doesn't hear you, then you could use the other one and it might, you know, uh, work better. Uh, me, and that should pick up in five seconds as always. Boom. Okay. Um, I have configured this thing a lot. Obviously, configuring these is a big uh, pain. I had to reboot the router once because, like I said about uh, <laughs> router firmware, mine stopped taking new connections, so that was a problem at one time. It certainly would be nice if uh, TP-Link, uh, when they ask you to change the Wi-Fi uh, network on this to one of the causes to configure, it'd be nice if they took you to the settings page. You can do that as an uh, iOS programmer. Um, and I did play around with Wireshark with these configured, and I still can't get it to send me uh, status over UDP like it does to the Google Home. 
Uh, but the Google Home seems to have no problem. So there's some packet I'm not capturing that makes it do that. Um, electrically, there is one now with both of these configured. There is, or I think it's with them configured. There is one uh, configuration of the four possible uh, uh, settings of the two relays that the dead traveler is actually dead. It goes to zero volts, but I don't know. Um, I didn't characterize that because I, I don't think it's important at this point. We're winding this up. Uh, also, I am not sure anymore about uh, the reboot. Well, see now if I hit reboot. Oh, see now, now it flashes. Sometimes reboot flashes the light, sometimes it doesn't. So I don't know if there's anything definite we can um, uh, say about that. Sometimes it makes the relay go and sometimes it doesn't. Now it's doing it every time. And I <clears throat> was just playing with this and it wasn't doing it every time. So I don't know uh, what to say about that. The other thing I noticed that I didn't get video of uh, because I thought it'd be easy to duplicate and it turns out it's never happened again is when both of these were configured I saw a little glitch on the rising edge of the uh, AC sine wave on the oscilloscope um, which could be communication but I think it's just probably just an artifact and since it hasn't happened again I guess you know it was just some kind of digital noise. Also while I was packet sniffing I saw every time you turn one of these on or off it makes a new connection to the TP-Link cloud, obviously to tell your account that the light is on or off. Uh, uh, so it's so that status is available. Finally, can I just say in passing, because I've taken this apart and put it together, you know, whatever, five, six times now, uh, it sure would be nice if uh, TP-Link used industry standard combination screws, which can be turned by a Phillips, a square head, uh, number one, and a flat head like everybody else. I, all the manufacturers of, of smart devices always wind up some, using some kind of Phillips or combination Phillips flat, and it's, it's just annoying. I suppose it's also worth mentioning you can just slam the straight wire underneath the screw and screw it down. You don't have to bend the wire around the screw like a QT Tech Review uh, does, so that's a little easier and faster. All right, I'm going to shoot a conclusion for this. Hey, you! Get, get out of here! <laughs> Well, here we are at the end. If you skipped here from the beginning, I don't blame you. And if you slogged through the whole mess, then thank you very much. You know, I put these together as I'm, you know, doing the, doing the work and I shot the introduction after I'd been to the garage, but the rest of it, I was kind of shooting and putting together as I went. And obviously I went down some rat holes and dead ends. So I hope you enjoyed the improvisational nature of discovery. Uh, uh, and I hope also that the uh, technical stuff, uh, the, the software stuff, the computer stuff wasn't uh, too much uh, technical gobbledygook. Uh, uh, for a lot of you, but I thought some of you would find it interesting. I wanted to know how it worked, you know, like it was interesting to know that um, the uh, Google Home has an intimate relationship with the CASA and that the CASA switch actually does know on and off. It doesn't just know relay in this position, relay in that position. Uh, so that, you know, that was interesting stuff. But it is true on this channel, I usually like to uh, uh, not pitch things at a simpler level, but if I'm going to go into a complicated world, take my time and kind of build it up step by step, and I kind of jumped right in, so I'm, I'm sorry about that. However, we did answer the uh, basic questions I set out to discover when I started this video. Uh, does the CASA do current sensing? Yes, it absolutely does. Does it matter if you use uh, four-way switches between the two three-way switches so you can control your lights from, you know, three, four, five, six, ten points? Uh, no, it, it doesn't really seem to. Uh, at least in most, you know, most uses uh, that I can uh, think of. Um, uh, can you only, do you only have to use one Kazi? Yes. Uh, does it have to be in the uh, line side box, the first box? No, it doesn't. It can be in the load side box because it takes power from the travelers as well as the common. With the caveat that you should probably favor the load side box because when a switch moves from uh, break to make, in the middle there, it's not connected to anything. So any switch that's transitioning before the CASA will turn power off to a load side CASA for just a brief moment uh, if you go slow enough. If you go fast enough, it's not a problem. But the CASAs don't seem to have a big capacitor in there to float over a long delay. I mean, it, it seems to be on the order of milliseconds. So, so that's a reason to kind of favor the, uh, the first box, the, the, the line side box, even though you don't have to. The other reason to favor it, of course, would be if you're going to put a manual dimmer in the circuit, you want to put that in the load side box so that a CASA at the front is always feeding full voltage down the line to a, to a dimmer. Of course, TP-Link makes a, a smart dimmer now as well, so you could use that. Um, is pairing uh, in the app, where you, where you tell the CASA app that your two switches are on one circuit, uh, uh, you know, doing anything magic and connecting these, these two devices into one comprehensive system. No, it's not. It's kind of a sham. It's just 
taking the, the Kaza you pair, the second Kaza, and making it a zombie. It takes it off the network and makes it a very expensive manual switch. So, you know, if you're going to buy two Kazas and put two Kazas in one circuit, do it for the aesthetics, but realize you're paying for a very expensive uh, bunch of electronics you're not <laughs> actually going to use uh, for anything in particular. And also, I would say, if you're going to do that, uh, pair, the, pair the switch in the load side box, you know, make it the dummy so that, the, again, you're favoring the line side box, even though you don't particularly have to. Um, we do have some mysteries that I didn't completely solve that I wanted to know. Do the Kazas talk to each other uh, over the electrical line? No, they don't seem to. Uh, nothing on the scope shows any kind of modulation. Uh, yes, uh, the Kaza in most configurations will drive uh, current onto the wire that should be dead. Because, you know, one, one traveler always has current on it, the other is always dead. But when you put a Kaza in there, suddenly you get current relative to ground, get potential relative to, to neutral uh, uh, on that other wire. It's about 10 volts lower than the, than the 120. Um, that's probably just an artifact of the way it's wired, but it could be used by one Kaza to infer the presence of another. I don't think that's probably what they do because that would, you know, require some software engineer to do some work and maybe some hardware uh, as well. And people don't like to, you know, manufacturers don't want to spend money on that kind of uh, stuff. But, you know, it is interesting. What I really should do is tear the thing apart and reverse engineer it and see how it works. I'd like to know. I am, I've been trying to come up with, you know, um, uh, circuits with diodes and whatnot in them to kind of do it. And I can come up with ones that work, that do the voltage drop and the pushing of the voltage, uh, whether the circuit is on or off. But I, it's, I'm having a hard time figuring out one that only does it when the circuit's on the way the Kaza does. So got to, you know, take it apart and look. And, uh, you know, I, I, and, um, you know, I've configured the things enough now and, and fought them getting on the Wi-Fi network enough now that I, I bet if I opened it up, I'm going to find they're using a crappy but cheap Wi-Fi chip like the MediaTek part, you know, that, that shows up in a lot of devices. Ugh, they're a nightmare. Um, so we did not answer the question what happened at Jordy's garage. Uh, we put an unconfigured Kaze in his circuit and it worked great. Uh, certainly one could make a case that uh, we changed the characteristic impedance. I know when I have two Kazas in the circuit, when they're configured, that uh, the travelers behave better, dead is dead in some situations, and it's obviously going to change the characteristic impedance of the line. And again, if they were using the voltage differential on the travelers to infer the existence of the second one, that would, could help the first one, but I don't think that's what's happening. I think what's more likely happening was happening at Jordy's house. Well, one of two things. One, his house is so big he had a mesh network, and we were having trouble connecting, you know, forcing him to connect to either the the repeater in the garage or the main router in his house. And I suspect most people have problems in those kind of setups. And I bet that's what our situation was too. As I said at the start of the video, when you add Wi-Fi radios and uh, software to three-way switch wiring, you know, you're in a world of insane complexity because you, and it's really hard to figure out, you know, what's, what's causing the uh, problem. What else was I going to say? There was another, um, uh, boy. Okay. Well, that, <laughs> <laughs> oh, I know what it was. Uh, the other thing that was in the uh oh screen, um, one, I don't know how long the make-break cycle on those Decora switches are. It, it could just simply be that we rebooted the one in the um, uh, load side box by flipping the Decora, you know, uh, slow enough. Uh, and maybe that's why we got our uh-oh uh, uh, screen. Who knows? Uh, anyway, uh, that's it for now. Uh, this is uh, more than I ever wanted to do on these three-way switches, but, it, you know, it's been interesting. And I hope you found it so, too. So please like, uh, click on my big head here to uh, subscribe, and uh, we'll see you on the next one.